Lizzo's album, Cause I Love You, was released in April 2019 to initially positive reviews. But on April 22nd, three days after the album was released, the artist tweeted, People who review albums and don't make music themselves should be unemployed. This was likely in response to a lukewarm review on Pitchfork by critic Rawia Kamir, who called Lizzo clearly a talent, but also said her songs could belong in any given rom-com or yogurt commercial. That same week, other celebrities like Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, Michael Che, and Olivia Munn took to Twitter to call out other critics who had less than positive things to say about their performances, their writing, and even their outfits. Soon, writers started noticing a pattern and writing about it, spinning up a social media-wide conversation about who has the right to critique an artist and how or whether artists should respond. But this conversation didn't pop up on social media one week in April because of one review. It was a long time coming, and it's built on a rapidly changing music industry. Music fans once used reviews to decide what records to spend money on. But in an era where streaming gives us instant access to every album available, we're struggling publicly and in real time to figure out what criticism is supposed to do now. Does music criticism matter today? Let's start with whether media criticism mattered to Lizzo. The week her major label debut dropped in April 2019 was probably a pretty great one for Lizzo. Cuz I Love You nudged Beyonce's album Homecoming out of the top spot on iTunes. Fans filled her social media mentions with all caps praise and fire emojis, and according to Metacritic, the album was rated an impressive average of 82 points out of 100. Like any artist who knows how to play the game of self-promotion, Lizzo shared and retweeted positive posts from fans and critics alike, giving them equal weight on her timeline. But a now-deleted subtweet changed the conversation. First, Lizzo tweeted that critics shouldn't be paid to write reviews if they don't make music themselves. She later backtracked and invited critics to watch her at work, telling the Detroit Metro Times, I wish they could be in a studio for one day and write a song. I wish they knew what it felt like to tear down somebody's baby, and that's all that I meant. By then, the story about Lizzo's reaction to critics was already out of her control. You know how in the media life cycle there are initial stories, and then the stories about the reaction to those stories, and then the stories that are a reaction to the reaction to those stories? Like that video game where you roll around that ball that picks up every thumbtack whale and spicy hot take it comes across? That happened here too. Lizzo's tweets happened as other celebrities were also talking back to their own critics, so think pieces popped up in outlets like BuzzFeed, Vice, Variety, and W Magazine, asking, why can't celebrities take a little criticism? Has criticism changed somehow, or have celebrities' expectations? Let's take a look at some of the answers that they came up with. The first possibility is that celebrities taking criticism are people, and, well, taking criticism is hard. As Allison Herman wrote for The Ringer, Thanks to social media, it's both harder than ever for stars to shield themselves from the noise and easier than ever for them to respond directly to what surely feels like an all-out assault on their character. Basically, celebrities are coming across professional criticism in the same places that strangers tell them things like, you suck and I hate your face, or a lot worse. And when it comes to something so personal as their art, it can be hard to see a lot of daylight between the two. And that feeling of being unfairly criticized goes both ways. Caitlin Tiffany pointed out for Vox that once a celebrity claps back at critics on Twitter, their fans can pile on those targets in defense of their idols, up to the point of making violent threats. Which leads us to the next possible contributor to this phenomenon of seemingly thin-skinned celebs, stan culture. These are the packs of unwaveringly supportive superfans, or stans, who do much of the promotional work that a positive review used to provide. You know all those people under every viral tweet telling you to stream Ariana's latest album on Spotify? If an artist can take to any social media platform and interact with these super fans directly, even one-on-one, -on -one, hear what their work meant to them, thank them for their support, and sell them a concert ticket, then they can avoid engaging with more critical media altogether. Critics also mention causes that are less personal and more structural. This whole chain reaction of stories is happening in a media landscape where the entire way we do criticism is evolving. Like when Beyonce said she changed the game with that digital drop, she wasn't kidding. Music critic Amanda Petrusich explained in The New Yorker that in order to surprise fans and prevent albums from leaking, the practice of sending advanced copies of albums to reviewers is mostly a thing of the past. But in order to keep up with the trending topics that swirl up around new digital releases, many reviewers are still expected to turn around a review in just a few days or even hours, trying to form a cohesive take based on first impressions. But, Petrusich writes, good art often takes 
takes time to make, and it often takes time to understand, too. The value of a piece of art doesn't always reveal itself in an initial impression, and that might have been the case with Lizzo's album, too. If you visit Lizzo's Metacritic page, you'll notice that the reviews were slightly better when reviewers spent more time with her work. Of her 10 highest ratings on Metacritic, only three were written within the first 24 hours of the album's release. Which brings us back to Lizzo's point about how critics are dealing with what she called somebody's baby, meaning her work, which might be why she felt other musicians were uniquely qualified to criticize music. After all, they know exactly how much work it takes. Right or wrong, Lizzo pointed to a larger trend in cultural criticism, the celebrity on celebrity profile. Whether outlets use this as a way to land otherwise elusive artists, or just to add another SEO-friendly name to a headline, more publications are assigning profiles of artists to their fellow artist friends. Which might mean that they have a good understanding of that person's creative process, but it also means that they might not have a good understanding of the role of criticism. Part of good cultural criticism is being willing to push or question an artist about their work, and that means your best famous pal might not be the right person for the job. And without trained journalists asking the questions, these important conversations about music can just turn into monologues. Most likely, it's all of these circumstances together that helped create the kind of environment that allows an album like Lizzo's collection of empowerment anthems to both be celebrated by critics and also for the artist herself to doubt criticism's relevance to her album at all. So, to get back to our big question, does criticism still matter? Maybe it just matters in a different way. One downfall of the social media conversation around criticism that multiple critics have pointed out is that celebrities are encountering criticism that was never for them. Basically, the classic wisdom of don't read the comments might be one way for artists to deal with criticism. After all, critics are creators in their own right. Cultural criticism has survived the era of overnight digital drops and on-demand streaming in part because it always offered more than a glorified shopping list. The Guardian critic Alexis Petridis argues that people aren't looking for reviews to be an end-all be-all evaluation of an album's worth. They just want that extra context to read along with their first listen. Just think about the last time you watched a show or listened to an album and then read reviews, and then the reaction to the reviews, and then all the stories reacting to the reaction to the reviews, all while you were still processing what you saw or heard. In this media landscape, music reviews work as kind of a companion piece to streaming services, to help an album's listeners contextualize all the conversations they're entering by consuming it. All of that gets to exist in a moment where music criticism matters less as a guide for what to listen to and more of a guide for how to talk about it.